Well, I once heard entrepreneur and writer Seth Godin describe what he calls the Goldie Hawn problem. So what's the Goldie Hawn problem, right? Godin writes, just over 200 years ago, Edward Rutledge signed the Declaration of Independence, and his direct descendants are Goldie Hawn and Kate Hudson. Like, what sort of odds, he says, would you have been willing to lay on that bet? You could be standing at his deathbed at 1800 with complete and total knowledge of his genetic makeup and the society in which he lived and the chances that you'd predict this outcome, that his direct descendants would be Goldie Hawn and Kate Hudson, is certainly at a zero. Moving on from this example, Godin highlights our desire, our desire to know the future and our inability to see what's ahead. We are now experts at the microphysics of collisions and at predicting how a billiard ball will roll or, or how long it will take a penny to hit the ground if we drop it off the Empire State Building. But add one or two or three hundred generations, and we've always, always, we always get it wrong. We always realize that we were wrong at some point along the way. The essential thing to remember is that every project is the work of generations upon generations of decisions leading to decisions of the unpredictable outcomes that come from human interactions. Given how unlikely it is that we would ever predict Goldie Hawn, the best posture for us is obvious. Expect that you're, that you'll be surprised. Let me ask you something. Uh, When you woke up this morning, when you started thinking about your day today, happy Mother's Day, by the way, when you woke up this morning or when you stopped to consider what God might do next in your life, when you started thinking about your day today and you stopped to consider what God might do next, are you confident in your ability to plan and predict what will happen. Are you? Or do you or do you expect to be surprised? I ask because of our text for today. In the story from Acts, the apostle Paul and his companions they're on the road and they're traveling in Asia Minor and and while they're in Troas, Paul has this vision. A man from Macedonia is pleading for Paul's help. And so Paul and his friends, they go to Macedonia, to the city of Philippi, where where they meet not the man who appeared in Paul's vision, but a woman named Lydia. Lydia hears Paul and is baptized by Paul. And then she invites Paul and his fellow travelers to stay in her home. And now when Paul was still in Asia Minor... Did Paul say to this group, hey, let's go over to Europe and let's find a dealer in purple cloth named Lydia because I think that's a really good prospect for God's church. Like, no, Lydia was nowhere on Paul's radar screen. God led Paul to Lydia and God led Lydia to Paul in a way that neither Paul nor Lydia could have ever seen ahead of time. And this This may seem like such a small, random story, right, in in Paul's life, but this story has this way of speaking to me. Maybe it, it has this way of speaking to you. It seems to poke and prod at that inability to see the future. I wonder if you've been to a graduation ceremony lately or or will be in the next few weeks, such as the time of year, right? And if, if you have, or if you will, as you sit in that crowd of people waiting for your person's name to be called, right? We've always sat in that, you know, four hours of name calling, right? You may find yourself thinking 
I found myself thinking about the future. Like, how this future right now arrived in my life so quickly. Like, how? Gosh, my daughter was heading off to kindergarten just yesterday. <laughs> but now, I'm here. Or, or what about that future? What about that future? Your son is graduating with honors from college. He doesn't have a job yet. <laughs> he may be wandering for a bit. Will that, will that be okay? Will he, will he be okay as he wanders? Will you be okay as he wanders? Will you walk alongside him as he figures out life? I wonder if you've spent any time recently thinking about the future. Perhaps you're, re you're considering retirement soon. Or perhaps you're thinking about starting a family soon. Or selling your house or changing careers. If you've done any of that kind of planning or reflecting or worrying let me invite you to consider our scripture for today one more time. You see, the first thing, the first thing that Lydia's story teaches us is that God is at work showing up in our lives and in, in, in our futures in ways that we cannot plan, cannot predict, cannot control. In his autobiography, Breaking Barriers, columnist Carl Rowan tells about a teacher who greatly influenced his life. Rowan relates how this teacher, Francis, Miss Francis, Miss Thompson, <laughs> had given him a sense of, of his opportunities in God's great creation. She's the first one to ever do that for him. One day she recited this quote to him. She said, make no little plans. <laughs> they have no magic to stir our blood and probably in themselves will not be realized. Instead, make big plans. Aim high in hope and in work. 30 years later, <laughs> In a speech columnist Rowan was giving, he recounted that moment and how that recited quote from one teacher shaped and influenced the course of his entire life. And after a newspaper printed the story about Rowan's speech, someone mailed the clipping of this to Frances Thompson, to Miss Frances. And she ended up responding, writing back to Rowan, Gosh, you have no idea, no idea what that newspaper story meant to me. For years, I endured my brother's arguments that I had just wasted my life as a teacher, that God wanted more for me, that I should have done something better with my life. When, and when I read, when I read that you gave credit for helping to launch your, your incredible career to me, I, I like put that clipping in front of my brother and I said, you see, it, it, I didn't waste my life, did I? In God's great world, my life has made a difference. I wonder what plans you're making for the future right now. What plans are you making for the future? Will your future go just like you think it's going to go? Or do you expect, do you hope that God might surprise you, meeting you unexpectedly in whatever river you find yourself resting at? And this seems to me to be a particularly relevant question for our church right now. Not just this time of year, not just this season of life, but for the Kingstown Communion, for our church. I can feel it. I can feel the energy has shifted. It's, it's this new season in the life of Kingstown. God is doing a new thing. 
what will the future of the Kingstown Communion look like? If the, if the current trend continues, how do we keep up with the growth we're seeing? How do we keep new members connected and plugged in beyond worship on Sunday mornings? How? How do we structure our children and youth programs, not just for the families that we have right now, but the potential of what's ahead? These are all good questions. These are actually fun questions to ask. It's the questions that our staff and our leadership team have been asking. And I remember, I remember Miss Francis, make no little plans. I think that's good advice for Kingstown. And whether or not we've ex explicitly claimed it, it's really how we have operated over the last six months. Make no little plans. Amidst the unknown of this year, we've just kept leaping with faith toward the future we believe that God has for us. Will people regather at Hayfield? I don't know, but they say they want it. So let's do it. Let's, let's see. Let's believe. Will, will children be engaged in children's ministry? Our families want it. We believe. Let's hire a children's director who can make it happen. And in the midst of our planning for the future, budgeting for the future, dreaming for the future, I think today's text is also important for us to recall that our calling, our calling as disciples of Jesus is not to know the future or to get the future to look like our image of what it needs to look like. Our calling is to just take the next faithful step to step into the future that God is giving us, no matter what that step looks like. Samuel DeWitt Proctor is this, this minister, this educator, humanitarian, who I deeply respect and who, you know, pastored this 18,000 member Baptist church in Harlem. Um, he was the recipient of like 45 honorary degrees throughout his life and, high demand as a preacher and speaker. Um, I still today go and, and, and pull up some of his sermons and, and listen to them. Um, an incredible human being and preacher. And late in his life, he was finally asked to preach at Duke Chapel, which is just this incredible honor. Dr. Proctor was known for his incisive insight and careful analysis of, of, of the biblical text. But on that Sunday, as that Sunday he had dreamed about, that he always was looking forward to that when he would be invited to preach at Duke Chapel, it always seemed like something he had hoped for in the future, but that was now the moment that had crept up on him. And on that Sunday, he didn't rely on what he was known for known for his incisive insight and careful analysis of biblical texts, but, but that was not what he offered that Sunday at Duke Chapel. After reading the text for the morning, he instead just started talking about his life. Growing up, I always wanted a red Buick convertible, he said. He talked about growing up in Norfolk, Virginia, where I'm from, and how he began to work in the, the Norfolk Navy Yard. As this young man, he, he did well and was the first African-American in management at the Navy Yard. As he began to rise through the ranks, he had his, his heart set on that red Buick convertible. Not, not only the car, he said, but on that three-piece red silk suit to go along with it, too. <laughs> well, about that time, he began to feel a call into ministry. And as he worked through it, he faced a variety of challenges and pushback. Those around him, everyone he knew, everyone who knew him well, were saying he shouldn't derail his, his career at the Navy Yard for this. Well, he shares this story, finally being invited to preach at Duke Chapel. 
He shares this story. He talks about his life. And then Dr. Proctor, he just smiles. And he said, God help you. God help you if you are ever met by Jesus. And then he just sits down. What is your capacity for surprise in your life, in your life of faith? What is your capacity for surprise? What is your capacity to let go of the future you had in mind for the future that God is giving you? Dr. Proctor was told very bluntly that he would ruin his life if he went into ministry. And and there was also this matter of what he had already set his heart on, right? His future was supposed to include a red Buick convertible. So Dr. Proctor is going on and on about all of this in Duke Chapel, about the Navy Yard and the silk suits and the red convertibles. And about 20 minutes in, even his biggest admirers are wondering, where is he going with all of this? And then he looks at this packed sanctuary and says, you know, I never owned a red Buick convertible. I wanted one. God knows I wanted one. Sometimes I confess I I get a voice inside me that says, like, listen here, Lord, I've got a good idea of where my life needs to go. Like, have you ever prayed that, felt that, said that to God? Imagine if Paul had said that to God in Acts chapter 16. If you read just a couple verses earlier in the 16th chapter of Acts, Luke tells us that Paul tries to go to to Bithynia and the spirit of Jesus, as our text puts it, the spirit of Jesus says, no, this isn't the way you need to go, Paul. And so Paul goes to Troas, where he had the vision that told him to go to Macedonia, which led him to meet Lydia. But what if instead of changing direction, Paul had fought it. What if he had fought it? What if Paul had said to God, look here, I've, I have done good work for you in Asia, and I'm going to keep traveling in Asia. No need for me to go over to Europe. What if Paul had said to God, look here, no, no. Then we wouldn't have gotten the conversion of Lydia And we wouldn't have gotten the conversion of Lydia's household. And you may say to yourself, like, what's the big deal there then? Well, according to Acts, Lydia is the first Christian convert in Europe. The first. Like, I would venture a guess that a good majority of you have ancestors who are from Europe. There's no way. To get an exact trace, no, there's no way to get an exact trace of Lydia's faith to other Europeans and then to your Europeans and to the faith that's now a part of you. There's no way to go back and prove that. No. (laughs) But I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if Lydia was an ancestor in the faith for you. What is your capacity to be surprised? By the next person God sends you, or the next job God gives you, or the next sacrifice God asks you to make, or the next step outside your comfort zone God asks you to take. And what does that mean for the future of our church? I hope God will surprise me. I hope God will surprise you. I offer this to you in the name of God the Father, in the name of Christ his Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God of surprise, your whole story, all of scripture, is just this unfolding of surprises. And yet, even when we know it, 
even when you surprise us, even when we've been surprised before, we still often pray, God, I hear, you know, listen up, God, I know how my life should go. God, so today we do not pray that prayer. We don't pray for all of our various worries about our future and all the various things we need to fall in line for that future to go the way we would envision it. We merely pray today. God, surprise us. Surprise me, God. Surprise us, God. Surprise our church, God. Oh, God of surprise, surprise us. We pray together that prayer that would have been this great surprise to Jesus' followers, that prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.